goodbye to my parents. And now I'm heading to Foxwoods. Let's see if I can uh, set up a dashboard mount here. All right, well, that didn't really work at all, so let's just go. Let's just go. Thanks, Jonathan. It's pretty awesome, right? Testing one, two, three, test, 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 test. All right, uh, it's about an hour, 45 minute drive to Foxwoods and I am about half an hour away now. It's been probably like three or four years since I was there. We'll check it out for maybe half, half an hour or something like that and then go hop in a game, go do it, get her done. All right, going to the top floor. It's a pretty dreary day, but we'll see what we can see. The hell is the top floor? Let's go. All right, well, I don't think they have a roof to this thing, or at least not one you can park on. So, here you go. So I wanted to go over some hands from Foxwoods uh, last week, but you know what? It's way too reasonably temperatured outside to do this in here. Let's go outside. So I haven't tried to do this yet, obviously. Uh, so we'll see how this works with the audio and everything. It's pretty echoey right here. I'm not sure how it's gonna go. So I played at Foxwoods this past week and it was the first time I'd played in a casino in a couple of weeks actually. Um, I was in New York City and uh, I will explain what was going on with that in the next vlog, but for now I just wanna go over a few of these hands. So in this hand we have an under the gun open to $30. There's one caller and I call with seven six of clubs in the cutoff. The small man also calls, so we go four ways to the flop. The flop is pretty decent. We pretty much flop the nuts. It's nine eight three with two clubs, and I actually have an open and straight flush draw here. Small blind checks, under the gun checks, and the cold caller in middle position bets. He bets sixty five dollars with around four hundred dollars behind. We have a couple options here. We definitely have enough equity to call and you know sometimes other people will come in behind us give us a better price but i'd rather take control of the hand and i'm totally willing to get it in here if i need to so i go ahead and make it 205 dollars uh it folds around to middle position and he ends up folding pretty quickly so we just take that one down that's it damn In this hand I open pocket eights over a limper and I end up getting two callers from uh, the button and then the limper, uh, I'm in the middle. The flop comes nine, four, three, two tone and it checks to me. Um, I could check this but I decided to bet mostly because pretty much every turn card is bad and I don't really like going into check call mode against 
um, the guy in position if I have to there. I definitely also don't want to check full to just one bet. So it feels kind of better to just bet, um, keep, represent keep representing a better hand. Then up both folding, so we just take it down. Not every hand involves a 5x over a bet shove on the flop, guys. Uh, again, going with a the theme of not very interesting hands, but talking about the ones that I actually recorded. I uh, three bet with ace five suited uh, over a small open, and I get uh, two calls actually. I get a cold call and the original opener calls. Uh, the flop comes rags, and I decide to see bet. I have a couple of back doors going on, and it's pretty hard for really anybody to have anything on a ragged board when they're cold calling C bets, uh, cold calling three bets. So I see bet, I end up taking it down. In this next hand, there is an under the gun limper, and I isolate from middle position to $25 with queen jack of spades. The limper calls, and we go heads up to a flop. The flop is 8-4-3 rainbow, so we don't really make anything, although we do have a backdoor flush draw and a backdoor straight draw and a couple of overs. The limper ends up check calling a $30 bet from me, and we go to a turn. The turn is a five of hearts. He checks, and I could bet again here with probably a reasonable, a reasonable likelihood of betting the river as well, but I just decided to check back. I feel like when somebody check calls this board, it's pretty often going to be a top pair hand. Uh, and if it's not a top pair hand, it's pretty much has to be a, like a gutter and almost, I think pretty much every gutter imp improves on this turn card. So uh, I just decided to check back. The river is a pretty interesting card. It's the two of spades, which brings a one liner to an ace. And he checks in a way that makes it pretty clear he's not super happy with the run out. Uh, now, part of the problem when you have situations like this is that people just really don't like to fold. Um, I, I really strongly considered checking back, but in the end I thought it was just too good of a card. My bet on the flop and check back on the turn really represents air, and so much of my air is going to be ace high. Uh, so I just decided to bet. I think I made a mistake here and I bet too small. Um, I only bet $65. I could have probably gotten away with doing like 85 just to really make it kind of uncomfortable for him. But I bet $65 and he tanks for a really long time. And you know, you could tell by the way he was handling his chips. He thought he was making a crying call, but. He did end up calling, and uh, he showed nine eight of spades. So, couldn't I get some spades in there? Couldn't we throw some spades out on that board one time, maybe? No? All right. Sex hand is pretty weird. I don't really think I necessarily played it the best I could have, um, but it presents a really interesting decision for uh, the other player involved. So let's get into it. There's an early position open to $25. I flat with jack 10 of clubs in middle position and the big blind calls as well. So we go three ways to the flop. The flop is pretty interesting. It's 10-4 uh, deuce all diamonds and we have clubs. It checks to me, I bet $55 into about 75. So action's back on the big blind and he makes it $180. Uh, the initial razor folds and it's back on me. Now this is a pretty interesting spot because I only have about $500 behind when we get to the flop. And so it's this is pretty much a decision where uh, he's threatening my stack even though he's not actually moving all in. I don't know. I don't know what the best line is here. I'd be really interested to hear what you guys have to say about this because I felt like I felt like any option was on the table. I thought folding was definitely reasonable. He's representing hands that either have us crushed or have a ton of equity against us. But there's also so many hands that we are basically flipping with that I felt like Calling and waiting for a safe turn to call down on would be reasonable. Calling calling flop to evaluate turn would be reasonable. Um, but I also felt like shoving was viable. I felt like 
if he had something like, I don't know, like 10-9 with a 9 of diamonds, like he could conceivably do this. And something like just two overs with like the king of diamonds or the ace of diamonds, something like that, were like very viable. And I think, I mean, we're definitely behind those kinds of hands, but we can profitably get it in. So I, I don't know, I, I ended up shoving for 500 total and the guy tanked for a pretty long time which is interesting because he made it 180, so it's like 320 to call, and he's, you know, there's, um, you know, there's over $700 in the pot at this point. So, so pretty interesting that he thinks for a long time, and he actually ends up folding. So, it's hard to know really what his thought process was, what he thought I had. In this next hand, there's three limps, and I make it $30 to go with uh, black jacks. The small blind, big blind, and one of the limpers call, so we go four ways to the flop. The flop is just okay. It's queen, six, five with two diamonds, and uh, it checks to me. I think if we were heads up, or maybe even three-handed, I'd probably bet and try to get some value from draws. Maybe once you value from like an under pair to the queen, something like that. But four, four away, I just didn't feel like there was that much value in betting. I have a ton of showdown value. I can evaluate turns and rivers, so I just check. The turn is above average. One might call it good. One might even call it favorable. Yeah, hello? Yes, this is, yes, this is he. Mr. Nimi? Cease and desist. What? I haven't, I haven't even uploaded this yet. Okay, all right, okay, all right. Yep, I, I'm sorry. I just, I didn't mean to offend anybody. I didn't know he had it copyrighted. Am I still allowed to say cheers? No? Okay, all right, yeah, no, no fun words anymore. We're, we're, we're done with fun words. We're done with fun words. All right, so we can't call it favorable. I would say it was definitely above average though. It's the Jack of Diamonds. It is a little bit of a weird card because it does bring in the flush, but because there's no flop action, it's not like we can really narrow people's ranges down to flush draws or anything like that. So it's definitely a good turn. The small line checks and the big line now actually leads for $60, which brings us to an interesting decision point. It folds to me and I guess I could raise here, but I think it just looks a little bit too strong and there's so many bad river cards for us that I felt like I would get a lot more value from just calling. So I call. Uh, I, def I definitely think it's up for discussion whether I should raise or call, so let me know in the comments if you think I should have played it differently. But I end up flatting and the small line actually flats as well, which is pretty awesome I think because it's usually going to be some kind of a draw or, you know, just like a weak queen that has like no chance of winning. So we're just, we're, we're in really good shape here. The river is, the river is, f it's, f it's f uh, flavorful. The river is the queen of diamonds and it makes us not quite the nuts, but just about as close as we can get, as well as bringing in the fourth diamond, which completes, uh, you know, a flush draw, which I think it's pretty likely for someone to have. And true to what I was thinking, the small blind leads now for $200, and the big blind just kind of shakes his head and mocks in disgust, clearly thinking he had the best hand. We know he definitely, he probably didn't, unless he actually had like, I don't know, seven, eight of diamonds or something. The small blind only has about $130 behind, so it's that time we, stick it in there and he obviously snap calls with the very obvious ace of diamonds i turn over my hand and he takes a couple moments to actually figure out that he's behind he turns over ace of diamond king ace of diamonds king of hearts and we scoop that pot thank you two calls sir two calls sir 
Yeah, I mean, I'm guessing those guys are buddies. Yeah, they like, thought it would be right? funny. Yeah. Or whatever. Yeah. 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 This hand isn't doesn't really have many interesting decision points, but it is another big pot, so why not talk about it? I open Ace Jack of Spades to twenty dollars from Under the Gun and Under the Gun plus one calls. Now, before I continue this, I need to tell you guys a little story about this player. <laughs> I was sitting in the eight seat at a ten-handed table, and uh, you know the guy in the ten seat. We were talking a little bit, but not a lot. So this guy comes in and sits down in the nine seat. He's wearing sunglasses. He's got the Apple earbuds in, and it's pretty obvious that he's a regular. And I think there's a pretty good chance he's a pro. Like right away when he sits down, within five minutes of him sitting down, like he's only played like one or two hands. Somebody walks up to him at the table and asks him for his autograph. Yes, you heard that right. He signs the autograph on, I don't know, like a bet card or something, and the guy leaves, and we, like, the guy in the tent seat and I are both obviously like, okay, like, what just happened? I've never seen someone ask for an autograph from someone at a poker table. So I just turn to him and I'm like, hey, so are you famous? He's like, uh, no, I just have a Twitch stream. It's pretty popular. I play online tournaments uh, on ACR, you know. Oh, all right, you know, that's kind of cool. He says he's a sponsored pro on ACR, but it's kind of weird because they don't actually, like, tell anybody that they have sponsored pros, so it's, like, not really a big deal. Uh, but they pay for all this, like, X number of buy-ins per month and blah, 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 blah. I'm like, okay, I mean, that doesn't really make sense because, I mean... Wouldn't, wouldn't they want you to know that they have sponsored pros if they're sponsored pros? But, you know, whatever. It's like, I guess it's plausible. Like, that it's just not well, like, publicized, what have you. So, you know, the game's going on. He's very interested in talking about himself. Because at one point, I, like, I said something to the effect of, like, oh, like, you know, I, it's cool that you have, like, a Twitch channel. Like, I have a YouTube channel. You know, I, I do a blog. And he's like... Literally, instantly when I say this, he goes, oh yeah, I have a YouTube channel too. I do interviews with like big names. I've done it with like Jeff Gross. I've talked with Elky, blah, 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 blah. And I'm like, holy shit, dude. All I said was I have a YouTube channel. I didn't then ask you like eight questions about your YouTube channel. And I mean like not to be a douche, but it's like being a conversationalist is partly like, you know, having a back and forth where like the other person talks, you talk, and then I talk, and like you talk, not just not just I talk, I talk, I talk, and you listen because I'm better than you. No, like that's not that's just not what a conversation should be. So you know, I'm already like a little put off by the guy. It's a little bit weird the whole you know the whole like I'm a pro and I'm sponsored and. Here's my Twitch stream. You know, whatever. So we're playing, and at one point the guy says something about, like, he says he's having trouble, like, withdrawing money from his ATM, so he's got to call his bank soon. Now, he not he's not really saying this to me or to the guy in C10. He's just kind of saying it, but he says it out loud, and so I'm instantly, like, this is a red flag for me. I'm like, is he going to ask me for money? Uh, is this other stuff kind of scamish? Like, I don't, I'm not really sure what's going to go on here. Like, if he's going to ask for money. At one point, the guy in seat 9, he, he gets up from the table. RDCR pro. He gets up from the table. The guy in seat 10 is like, yo, dude, I'm not sure this is legit. He only has like 300 Twitter followers. Like, how do you, how can you possibly be big on Twitch? And I was like, well, I don't really know Twitch that much. So, I don't know if it's possible to get big on Twitch without being big on other social media sites. So, the, the guy comes back. We're playing for a couple more hours. And um, somebody, some friend of his comes over to the table and asks if he wants to grab dinner. And he's, like, very, you know, noncommittal. He's like, oh, like, I'm not that hungry. He's like, oh, well, I'm going to go eat. Do you want something? And he's finally like, yeah, okay, I'll go. And so he gets up and goes with his friend. The guy in the tent seat, like, looks at me. For the first time, he's, like, really looking and focusing on me. And he's like, that was the same guy. What? No, it wasn't. That was the same guy, for sure. The guy that asked for his autograph just came up and was like nonchalantly like, yo, you want to grab food? Like, like they're best friends. So at this point, it's like almost definitely a scam. You know, there's just pretty much no way it's not. So we're just kind of like chuckling about this back and forth. And I, like, I'm just waiting for the guy to come back and ask for money at this point. They come back maybe an hour later. He doesn't ask for money, but he does kind of complain about 
the bank a couple more times. At this point, I'm not really engaging. It's much less interesting to me now, but then we end up playing this hand. I'm really curious what you guys have to say about this guy. Was he completely scamming? Was he just trying to promote his, his Twitch stream? And was what he was doing even ethical? Like, even if he's just promoting it, is this an ethical way to do it? I don't know, but I think it's pretty interesting. So anyway, on to the hand. The big blind also ends up calling. So we go three ways to a flop. I have ace, jack, and spades. Flop is 10-9-7 with two spades, so I flopped enough flush draw, got shot two overs. It's above average for sure. The big blind checks, I see bet $45. The under the gun plus one player raises to $150 and the big blind folds. The under the gun plus one player only has about $450 when we get to the flop, so I don't think I'm necessarily really getting fold equity, but I also feel like he can raise some sorts of draws that we're ahead of. He can have hands that we have just so much equity against that we can never really fold. So I just decided to stick it in there. Uh, shove for what ends up being 450 effective. He snap calls faster than the speed of light and he has pocket tens. Uh, the turn, there's no sweat. I turn the five of spades and then river the queen of spades for the super flush. It's not quite the mega uber duper quadruple flush it's not a seven card flush but you know six card flush it's definitely worth more than a five card flush am i right am i right so we scoop that hand and he leaves in disgust at that point yes, I think I parked too close. <laughs>